All right, everybody, let's take a moment here to give credit where credit is due. If you haven't heard about Anchor before, you're hearing it from me now, all right? It's a creation app that allows you to record, edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. It will distribute your podcast for you so you can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. It is free. What did I say? Yes, yes, I said it's free. You can make money from your podcast as well. So what are you waiting for? Go and download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Let's go. What's up? What's up? Good day, world. Yes, it's me, (laughs) your friendly neighborhood pharmacist, and I am back for another episode of Health Facts. (laughs) And as usual, I am happy to be here sitting on my chair Mm -hmm. on this beautiful Wednesday. I hope it's beautiful wherever you are because it is amazing right here. Um, And I have the most interesting topic to talk about today. One of my coworkers suggested that I talk about this one because it's kind of relevant, actually very relevant to the public health crisis that we're going through. And you know, it's relevant to both past, present and future. So let's hear it, not yet. (laughs) Um, I just wanted to give a brief disclaimer before I get started. Um, Some people might find this subject a little bit controversial. And if you're listening to it, it may rub you the wrong way, but, I'm going to talk about it anyway. (laughs) And I just have one favor to ask. Make sure to listen to the entirety of this episode before you jump into any conclusions. Yes, you Sarah, I'm talking to you. (laughs) I promise if you haven't learned anything from any of my prior episodes, no worries. I'm not judging, but I kind of (laughs) am. But it's okay. There's hope. There's hope because you are definitely going to learn something from this one. All right. Okay, now I chose this topic because I'm basically one foot in the public health door. You know, the other foot still in pharmacy, don't worry guys. Um, I have a lot of passion for this and you know, it's the main reason that I started this podcast in the first place. And I don't know if you all paid attention coming into this podcast, but the name of the podcast is Health Facts. Health facts. Ignore the wrong spelling. It is health facts. Um, still means the same thing, which means I'm here to state the facts. But I will still let you decide what you want to do with the information that I give you. My main goal here is to make sure that every decision that you make where your health is concerned is educated. So here goes. Oh, wait. Um, before I get into this week's topic, I'm going to digress just briefly. So I've gotten a few questions from people regarding this podcast, and I just wanted to address them real quick. So some people have asked me, why don't you start a YouTube channel? Have you seen my face? <laughs> I'm butt ugly. <laughs> I can't just kidding. I'm not butt ugly, but ugly. <laughs> I'm laughing because I know my mom is going to see this or listen to this and yell at me <laughs> because she hates when I say that. Um, but jokes aside, I can't do a video recording um, because I'm kind of awkward. So I'm just going to save you guys all of that. <laughs> the second thing is I've also been asked to refer to myself as a doctor. Dr. Ode Moody. <laughs> Repeat after me. Dr. Ode. Uh, okay, you can't? <laughs> well, that's why. <laughs> Anyways, um, retail pharmacists, typically we don't refer to ourselves as doctor, most of us anyway. Um, I think after getting yelled at and cursed out a couple of times <laughs> by people you're trying to help, <laughs> you kind of realize that nobody cares about that dumb title. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No offense to any doctors out there. We all worked really hard. We deserve some recognition. So if you'd like to, please slap that title on your shirt, your name tag, your email, wherever you can put it. I do not care. But put some respect on that last name. <laughs> I'm all for it. Okay, now let's move on. <laughs> You know, I read a book last year um, called Overtreated, Why Too Much Medicine is Making Us Sicker and Poorer by Shannon Brown. It is a good read. But the main reason why I'm bringing this up is because there was um, a drug that was mentioned on there um, that I wanted to talk about real quick. 
One of the stories on there is based on a doctor's account of his battle with the FDA and pharmaceutical companies regarding the medication known as Orabilex. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. So this medication was given to patients prior to an x-ray to kind of visualize gallstones. And it was recalled in 1964 because it was found to cause potential harm. And this would basically harm um, kidneys, cause like renal failure or like issues with the kidneys. Um, and sometimes it resulted in death. So um, there were several incidences of this side effects, but for some reason, the manufacturer failed to inform doctors about it. According to the medication label, it had spectacularly low toxicity and notable absence of side effects. I don't know why I use this accent when I'm talking about people lying, but I just, it just sounds right. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Based on the recollection of um, a doctor called John E. Weinberg, who at the time was a medical resident at John Hopkins, an elderly woman who underwent a gallstone removal procedure um, they had used the medication to visualize the gallstone. So um, she ended up developing kidney failure after and then went on dialysis, which, I mean, that's kind of random. Someone had a healthy kidney and then they didn't. So, I mean, going from healthy to dialysis, that's pretty huge. Um, so they found the culprit to be Orabilix. Um, so Dr. Weinberg decided to do more research on this medication to figure out why or, you know, what was causing this problem. So he discovered that there were actually reports that were similar to what happened with his patients um, relating to this medication. And this was seen by other doctors and other hosp hospitals as well. So Dr. Weinberg thought, I got to do something about this. And like any good doctor would do, Dr. Weinberg reported the problem to the manufacturing company. And he also reported it to the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration of the United States, for anyone who's not aware what that means. Um, and they did nothing. So that, that happened. And, you know, he was, you know, he was very determined and he wanted to do something about this because he has seen what this medication can do to people. So he decided to try again to resolve this problem by writing a letter presenting all of the evidence that he had found about the dangers of this drug. And he wrote the letter to Senator Hubert. And he basically urged him to go to the FDA about the drug. So Hubert took this letter to the White House. And it was then that the manufacturing company had realized, oh, the White House, they know about this. Um, and they're going to meet with the FDA about the drug. So um, let's withdraw from the market. Okay. So they voluntarily withdrew it from the market. Crazy, huh? And you know, once again, the day is safe thanks to Dr. Winberg. Um, but the situation described in the story resulted, I'm sure, in gradual loss um, of trust in the healthcare system. But I would like you to note, though, that the solution was also provided by someone in the same system. All right, just keep that in mind while I go through my next example. All right, so my next example, some of you have heard of it. It's called the thalidomide tragedy. This thalidomide tragedy is something I've heard about so many times in my life. If you're in healthcare, you've heard about this a bajillion times. If you're in public health, you've heard about it more than a bajillion times. So it comes up a lot. And it's probably, arguably, one of the most disastrous mistakes in healthcare history. And you know what? Put my name on it. I said that. <laughs> okay, so I found an article on Helix by Northwestern University that kind of, it kind of accurately described the events leading up to the tragedy. And feel free to go check it out if you like to. Um, there's a lot more information on there than what I'm going to give you, but I kind of lay out the basics. So, lalidomide. It was widely used in the 50s and the 60s for the treatment of nausea in pregnant women. It was initially labeled as an over-the-counter remedy for sleeplessness. But it was later found by a doctor in Australia to be effective against... Uh, morning sickness in pregnancy. So um, doctors started using it for that. And so it was actually advertised as completely safe even during pregnancy. It was available in several countries in Europe, Asia, Australia. Um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, physicians started to recommend it for nausea during pregnancy as an off-label use. And for some of you who don't know what off-label use means, it basically means that a medication is prescribed for one use, like it's been FDA approved for 
one use, but then people find that it works for something else and they start using it for that as well. That's an off-label use. So, um, later, physicians started to notice um, cases of serious birth defects. And potentially, they realized that this um, birth defects potentially resulted from the use of this medication during pregnancies. And babies who are exposed to the medication in the fetus um, were born with shortened or absent or flipper-like limbs. And this is known as phocomelia. And if you'd like to get a better visual of what this looks like, you can Google search it and it's on there. It's pretty insane. Um, and it was estimated that at least 15,000 children worldwide were born with this malformation that resulted from the thalidomide. And some of the babies who were exposed to this medication died before birth or soon after. As of today, less than 3,000 of the children exposed to this medication are alive. So it's pretty significant. I mean, lots of lives were lost. And they, there's not really a number, a set number on how many lives were lost because some of these um, kids were, died in the womb, basically. They didn't even get a chance. Um, they weren't born um, because it depended, I guess, on which stage of the pregnancy and also um, the severity of the damage that it had done. So um, even though there are some children that um, were born, they were exposed to this medication because of the severity of the malformation, some of them didn't have a chance at survival, basically. And that's why they were life was lost, lost later on. All right. But you know the crazy thing, by some lucky turn of fate, approval of this drug was delayed in the United States. So some of you may know the United States was not affected by this as much as like all the other countries were uh, because it was put on hold by FDA inspector Francis Kelly, Kelsey, Kelsey, get it right. Um, he had some concerns about the risks of peripheral neuropathy. So at the time, they didn't even know about the um, teratogenic effects so the birth defects. They didn't know about that. They were just holding on off on the approval because there was another side effects that they were a little bit concerned about that had nothing to do with the birth defects. So I would say the United States, they dodged a bullet in this case. However, the FDA still used this strategy as a sign to take more precautions where drug approval is concerned. So they passed a new um, drug amendment at that basically tightened restrictions around the approval process for drugs to be sold in the United States. Now it requires manufacturers to prove that they are both safe and effective before they are marketed. And I'm over here thinking, how was this not a requirement before? I mean, so they were just throwing drugs in the market that were not safe and effective. <laughs> I'm confused. Anyways, the lidomite obviously was withdrawn from the market, but after a few years, it did get approved again. However, however, before you say anything, this time it's used for the treatment of leprosy and a type of cancer known as multiple myeloma, which um, this medication shows significant benefits to that. I, I will not argue on the use. I do know, however, that they did carefully weigh the risks versus benefits. And I also know as a pharmacist that um, this drug is actually in the program that um, a lot of pharmacists have to enroll in if you're involved in this program and if you're a doctor or a patient or a pharmacy. Um, and they basically, anyone who's using, distributing, prescribing this drug, they have to be in the program and they have to be registered and it requires extensive vetting. Um, they do a lot of monitoring of all the parties involved and um, usually in individuals that are on these kinds of medication will have to be tested for pregnancy like twice um, before they're even prescribed the medication. And when they're prescribed the medication, they only have like a short period of time before they have to pick it up. If they don't pick it up within a short period of time, they lose that prescription, they have to go back to the doctor. So it's pretty intense. Um, so yeah, I would say that, you know, that's a better way to go about it. Anyways, there was definitely a huge lesson learned from this incident. Hopefully nothing like this will ever happen again. And something I was curious about though, um, was that I was wondering if the genetic malformations in the individuals that survived this um, medication was like passed on to their offspring. And the answer is no. So that's good. That's um, comforting. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and talk about the biggest failure <laughs> in the history of healthcare, in my opinion. Put my name on it. I said it again. And this is the Tuskegee experiment. Yes, I'm sure many of you have heard of this one. And if you haven't, well, I'm here to educate you on it. 
Um, this study was performed in 1932 at the Tuskegee Institute in Mason County, Alabama. The aim of this study was to record the natural cause of syphilis in African Americans. And let me tell you, the name of the study, and I quote, was Tuskegee Study of Untreated Syphilis in the Negro Male. <laughs> Anyways, the study enrolled 399 black men with syphilis and 201 black men without syphilis. Um, participants were recruited to join the study without being provided an informed consent. So an informed consent basically tells them the risk and the benefits of the study, and it tells them they can enroll in the study if they want to, they can leave if they want to, whenever they want to, it's on them. Like they get the choice. No one's coercing them, no one's forcing them to be in it. So that, you know, it's pretty important to give someone before enrolling them in the study, but let me continue. So they were basically told that they were being treated for quote unquote, bad blood. The truth, however, is that they had no intention of treating this men. The study was actually intended to progress for six months, but instead it lasted for 40 years, 40 freaking years. These men were going through quote unquote treatment for syphilis. Come on now. Okay. So let me keep going. So, um, in 1947, penicillin actually became the drug of choice for the treatment of syphilis, but these men were not informed nor where they offered a treatment that could literally save their lives and end their suffering. As many as 28 men died as a result of untreated syphilis and 100 more from its complications. Up to 40 spouses were diagnosed with it, not to mention it was passed on to 19 children at birth. Whew, okay. I'm gonna pause for a moment. In 1972, a story was released in the media about the Tuskegee study and the resulting uproar forced the Assistant Secretary for Health and Scientific Affairs to put together an advisory panel that will evaluate the study. The panel found out that although these men joined the study at their own volition, there is no evidence that they were informed of the true purpose of the study. I mean, that's just the most unethical thing that I've ever heard of being done to another human being. I mean, after slavery, of course. Um, the panel concluded that the study was ethically unjustified. No shit. Excuse my language. This podcast is supposed to be for, you know, PG-13. <laughs> but that's just trifling. and I had to say it. Let's keep going. PG-13. <laughs> they were basically experimenting on humans for sole purpose of knowledge. But in addition, they discriminately chose to experiment on African Americans. Now, let me see how many of the three ethical principles were broken in this case. One, respect for persons. Two, beneficence. Three, justice. Oh, all of it, all of it was broken. But the ethical principles were not within yet. Apparently, this grown ass, supposedly educated adult needed someone to write a script basically pointing out to them what is okay and not okay to do to another human being. I mean, that's just ridiculous. Whew. Okay, let's keep going. In the summer of 1973, a class action lawsuit was filed on behalf of the study participant and their families. And in 1974, Surviving participants, along with their children, received a 10 million out of court settlement. And the US government also promised to give lifetime medical benefits, burial services, and you know, to all the living participants. So some compensation, I guess. Um, I just have no words for um, what these researchers did to these people. But all I can say is that I hope that something like this never happens again. The upside of this event is that it really put a spotlight on the ethical aspect of conducting scientific experiments on human beings. The National Research Act was signed into law protecting human subjects of biomedical and behavioral research. So yay, one step for mankind. Ah. Okay, the moral of the examples that I just gave is that a lot of mistakes have been made in healthcare and a lot of wrongs have been done to individuals who have fully put their trust in the healthcare system. But you know what? After the smoke clears up and the dust settles, you have to notice a common theme here. 
The healthcare system is not one person. It involves a large number of pieces, and these pieces are made of people. They are not gods. They are not machines. They are just people like you and me. And if you take a look around you, you may see different kinds of people. They're good people, just like they are bad people, just like they're greedy people. And the people that make the healthcare system are no different. But thankfully, there are fail safes put in the system. And this fail safe are in place because the system is not perfect. And we are fully aware of it. I only hope that we get to a point where only good intentions prevail and all the unintended consequences are averted. Now that I've successfully made some of you guys very angry, I'm gonna shift the mood real quick by pointing out some of the more positive aspects of healthcare. I know some of y'all are probably thinking, why in the world should I ever trust a system that's failed so many times? Well, because my friend, you don't have a choice. At the end of the day, it's still better than depending on natural survival. You also have to keep in mind that it is a system with lots of moving parts. It constantly modifies itself and tries to improve its own outcome. And a perfectly good example is a massive increase in life expectancy over the, over the last few years. Not to mention infant and maternal mortality rates, vaccinations, treatments, and early diagnosis of chronic diseases. These are a lot of things that have changed over the last few years. We've come a long way. And majority of the credit goes to science. It goes to research. It goes to medicine. It goes to public health, etc. Remember, do you remember when sanitation was not a thing? Oh yeah, you don't? <laughs> Let me tell you. Once upon a time, people lived in their own filth and had no idea why they were dropping one by one from diseases. The end. So now, when you take your trash to the dumpster, remember to thank the pioneers of public health for making this happen. What about polio, cholera, yellow fever, whooping cough? Some of you don't even know what that is. And I bet you some of the doctors in the United States can't even stand up and say that they've ever seen a case of any of these diseases. Why? Because of healthcare. Remember when HIV diagnosis was a death sentence? Yeah, it no longer is. Now, some of you may say that we have this new diseases because of the advancements in healthcare. Here's my rebuttal. If you listen to my episode on the history of pandemics, you'll learn something. New diseases come and go. They have for generations. The only difference is now we have people that study them, we know how to treat majority of them, and new outbreaks don't last for decades. My second argument is that back in the day, many people did not live to adulthood, much less old age, because they were probably killed from acute infections, sometimes even work or health hazards. This is no longer the case because do I even need to answer this? Yeah, healthcare. Now we get to see the result of our own buddies we're in here because we get to live to old age. This sometimes includes the development of chronic diseases or simply frailty. And just in case I haven't convinced you yet, I'm gonna add a little more fact. There are people who have died in the past from unknown causes because of the absence of proper diagnostic tools. This is no longer the case. I mean, where a lot of diseases are concerned, We've gone from a life expectancy of 28 worldwide, 28, I mean 28 years old, 28 years old worldwide to 73. And this is just between the early 1800s and 2021. And in the United States, the life expectancy has gone from 39 to 79 years old. And just in case anyone's curious, because I was curious, the country with the highest life expectancy currently is Hong Kong at 85. Yes, somebody to tell me what they're doing right. Anyways, let me hit you with some more statistics because I'm not done just yet. So just between 1950s and 2021, the infant mortality rate in the United States has gone from 32 to 6 per 1,000 live births. A similar trend is seen in many other countries as well. Now, I understand there's a lot of mistrust in the healthcare system, and that's completely fair. I'm not even going to argue with you about that. However, if you go see a doctor when you have a cold or a severe injury or a heart attack, I hate to break it to you, but it means you believe in the solution that the healthcare system provides. It is true that not everyone in healthcare has your best interests at heart, but that is also true in your family. Not all of them have your best interests at heart, 
or that friend group that you just won't let go of. People are motivated by different things, some by money, some by knowledge, but then there are some that truly care. This applies to every single human being. So what can you do about this? Let me tell you. The same thing that you do about that friend or family member that you don't trust. Use logic, ask questions, get a second opinion, do your research, and pray. This is where your internal locus of control comes in. Do not depend solely on others for your survival. You must trust yourself as well. Play an active role in decisions regarding your health. One thing you should not do under any circumstance is completely deny yourself of the benefits that healthcare has to offer. Because statistically speaking, you won't survive for very long without it. And that's my two cents. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode today. I had so much fun putting it together. And as usual, I've run out of things to say. So I'm going to let you guys go. And like I say on every episode, subscribe. Subscribe if you haven't already so you don't miss an episode. And also leave a positive review and drop a comment. Let me know how you feel about this episode and what you would like to hear about in future episodes. Now, you can find more information on my Instagram at healthfacts, facts spelled with the CX at the end, or find my blog at www.healthfacts.com. Same spelling. Send me a message or an email with a topic that you're interested in hearing more about. Oh, and before I forget, I created a new Facebook page. Yeah, Facebook. So if you're on Facebook, you can find me on there as well. Again, thank you guys for listening and I will see you next Wednesday. All right, everybody, let's take a moment here to give credit where credit is due. If you haven't heard about Anchor before, you're hearing it from me.